leaves already, my goodness. Oh, hey, there we go. So I've just been up here doing lip service. No. Anyways, we're all tuned in. Welcome to everyone, those of you who are watching online, those of you who are uh, in the neighborhood or perhaps in your car. It's so great that we can gather from our different places and still be community together. God is so good, and we're enriched by that every day of how um, we know that our hearts are joined with many, not only in this community, but around the world. Our hearts are together in Christ our Lord, so this is, this is good. The Mission and Outreach Committee would like to express their thanks for uh, the children's plate. That's the little brown one that sits out front. Um, over, the, over the last number of weeks, we've collected $450 for the 541 eatery, which I think is one of the biggest offerings we've had out of that plate. And uh, so the average meal there is about $7, so you can imagine how many people we've been able to feed uh, through that. Um, that's if they get a meal, if it's just a coffee, it goes a little further to help those particularly who are homeless and, uh, and would like some nourishment. And also community. I don't know if you've ever had lunch at the 541. You really should. It's just a great place of mixing and mingling people of uh, rich and poor and young and old, and um, it really is a neat community. So I encourage you to do that sometime if you're headed downtown on Barton Street, then, uh, then do pop in. Also, um, yes, photos for the photo directory. There's a few more squiggling in, and um, our elders will probably be calling you in the next while to give those of you who um, are outside of our reach right now a bit of a reminder. Also a reminder, we've put out a 175th anniversary booklet um, it was available at our drive-through or walk-through anniversary, um, but many of you have not had one yet, and so they're here at the church. Also downstairs, it's not quite put back together, but uh, the, the pictures and the history of Car Luke are on easels downstairs, and you can uh, have a walk through memory lane. Some of it still needs to be set up. Um, but that should be happening in the next couple of weeks. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah. It's a responsive call. If you would like to join me in, in reading that, you'll be responding with the yellow highlights. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can humanity hide themselves in secret places so that I cannot see them? declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Sunday mornings are that time when we place all our anxiety, all our trust back on the Lord. And let me just share with you a, a little testimony or a little confession. I have to confess that this week was a nail-biting, anxious week as we, um, Hannah was flying overseas to begin her schooling, and she was leaving on Friday, and Thursday afternoon at supper time, the, um, a certain embassy, I won't want to knock any countries, a certain embassy did not return her passport with her student visa in it. So we were on the phone trying to change her flight. The anxiety was high, and so we sat down with Hannah and said, look, what's the worst that can happen? It's totally out of your control. We have to wait on this embassy to do what they need to do, and we have to trust that the Lord will care for you. The worst that can happen is you're going to leave a little later. 
Every time we got a little bit anxious, we tried to center ourselves once again. Long story short, her passport came in 1.30 Friday afternoon on the day she was leaving. So she's gone. <laughs> but at the same time, it's a reminder that we come here on Sunday mornings to just hand all that stuff over to the Lord, including myself, and just say, Lord, there's so much out of our control, and we trust you. We trust you no matter what. Whether things go great in our life or things don't, we trust you. And this is what we do every Sunday. We renew our hearts and our spirits so that we might continue on. Let's sing our song this morning. I'm not sure which one it is. Open my eyes that I may see. Gracious Lord, our lives are filled with so much noise and busyness, struggle, hardship. Our world sometimes just feels like it's falling apart. There is much turmoil. And so, Lord, we pray that in this moment we might just be silent and be renewed as we hear your assurance, you are with us. You help us carry our burden. When we are weary, we can hand it over to you. And Father, you are so quick to answer as we lift up our hands and say, it's out of our hands. We give it to you. So Holy Spirit, come refresh us Open our eyes that we might see all the wonderful things that you are doing for us. And Father, as we confess our anxieties, our lack of trust, as we confess those things that come into our minds and our hearts and out through our actions that have hurt your heart, harmed others, have been ignorant of needs around us. All these things, Lord, we confess. And we long, Jesus, for your sanctification, that we might become more and more like you. And we thank you that you accept our heart's desire, as broken as it is, with thanksgiving and praise, and you renew us, and you strengthen us, and you come to us. You are a gracious and good God. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts this morning 
that we may be refreshed by your spirit, that we may be spurred on to carry out your work, and that we might declare the praises of our God. In your name we pray, amen. We, I always find this time awkward still. Where's our choir? Yeah. <laughs> always waiting for that choir to sing a wonderful tune. Nancy Lane's going to read our text this morning from Jeremiah 1. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests that's Anatoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jeho Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods and in worshiping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready, stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Old Testament, not always a place we like to be. And yet for the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at a couple of texts in Jeremiah. Why the Old Testament? Well, scripture in the New Testament says God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's the same God in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. The difference being Old Covenant salvation is under law, New Covenant Salvation is under grace through Jesus Christ. But God is still speaking about salvation here in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet, and he's sent specifically to kings and nations. He's not talking to individual people here. 
He's, he's prophesying of more wars, uprising, displacement, and exile. The boiling pot from the north is the Assyrians coming in and taking over Judah, later to be followed by the Babylonians as a result of, not ha of having sinned against Yahweh. Not only because they broke the law, that's secondary to God looking at them saying, you're living lives of hypocrisy. You come to the temple and, and offer sacrifices, but you lack genuine worship. And those remaining in the land would experience hunger, poverty, and other exiles from other nations are sent to them from the Babylonians who bring in their own culture, their own gods. In fact, they, the Jews allowed these other gods to be set up in their temple. And they began to worship them. And they practiced immorality. I'm not so sure that life is much different today. Pandemics political uncertainty, multiculturalism, Christianity being watered down with syncretism. All gods are good. All ways lead to truth, speaking or seeking spiritual direction from stars or horoscopes, self-medicating and self-meditating, self-absorption, building personal empires while thousands go unsheltered. Israel no longer heeded the Lord and needed leadership. And so God and Jeremiah promises them a new covenant, the almond branch, a new shoot representing peace. It's okay if the PowerPoint's not on. Well, maybe. Next. We're about three down. There. Thank you. My, my, that's on me. It's interesting how both Jeremiah and Jesus were known and called at conception to preach destruction, if you hear from our text. They both preached destruction, repentance, and hope. Both wept over Jerusalem. Both were accused of being crazy for preaching God's word. Both reprimanded the leadership for steering people away from God's truth. Both were rejected. Both suffered. Both were thrown in a pit. Both executed. Why? Because they preached light where there was darkness, and hope where there was despair. Might our world, might we need to hear the words of Jeremiah and Jesus once again, draw near to the Lord, repent, lean on him, calling believers to be God's light in a very dark world. Judah longed for things to return to normal, and Ron Clemens notes that when they returned to normal, they had the irrational belief that God would guard and protect them no matter how they conducted their lives, a complacent optimism that resulted in their downfall. Philosopher Soren Kirkard presented a parable on Sunday morning in Duckland, all the ducks dutifully came to church, waddling through the doors down the aisles to their pews, where they comfortably squatted. When all were situated and the hymns were sung, the duck minister waddled to the pulpit, opened the duck Bible, and read, Ducks! You have wings, and with these wings, you can fly like eagles. You can soar into the sky. Use your wings. It was marvelous, uplifting duck scripture, and thus all the ducks quacked and approved with a hearty amen. Then they plopped down in their pews and waddled home. 
in the parable of the banquet, Jesus warns, there's no room for excuses. Saying, I cannot come to the banquet. I like how I'm living. I like my lifestyle. I'm too busy working, trying to cope on my own. I cannot come. Benjamin Franklin said, he that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. Jeremiah tried to excuse himself from prophetic calls. From verses, um, verse 6, Jeremiah basically tells God, I'm not your guy. He excuses himself from this prophetic call because he is only 17 years old. I'm too young, too inadequate to speak to kings and nations. I never went to the school of the prophets. I never went to seminary. Send a Levite priest, maybe a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, not me. But Jeremiah, like all Jewish boys, studied the Psalms heavily. And so God redirects Jeremiah's perspective from a Psalm that we looked at last week, Psalm 139. You are my guy, says God. I knitted and weaved your very, my very image into your being. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And now God makes a very direct call to Jeremiah. I appointed you already at conception to be my prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, I've equipped you for this job, so it's no excuse to say I'm only a youth. I will send you to speak whatever I tell you. And then the Lord reached out and he touched Jeremiah's mouth and empowered him. God's word has come through Jesus Christ, through scripture. Words of assurance, of watchfulness, guidance, deliverance, hope. A call to live justly and love kindness. These are more than just words. They're a spiritual reality that call God's people to action, to speak, to confess individually, but also to act out in faith as a, as a Christian community to this generation, to our leaders thinking about tomorrow's election, to our people, to our neighbors, our children, our grandchildren. Like Jeremiah, we might weep over the hardships of life but also weep over a broken world and the lost sheep separated from Christ who don't have the same almond branch of hope that we do. Excuses are not valid. In Psalm 139, we know that God has weaved his image in us, equipping us to be his witnesses, his hands, his feet, and participate in his redemptive plan. Under the new covenant, God has put our words in our hearts, prophesies Jeremiah in chapter 29. And as we learned our purpose from last week, to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light, sharing it with others. It's not easy. It won't be easy. The Holy Spirit will empower us, but preaching repentance, changed lives, speaking of discipline. Preaching about how it's better to give than receive, to be a servant than the boss, being a Christ follower is increasingly controversial. It's no bed of roses to stand up for your faith, or with your faith. Jeremiah knew it would be hard. Jesus knew it, and God doesn't sugarcoat it. Even that's not a valid excuse. Today, says God, I am the one who has made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the population. They will fight against you. But you will prevail. Since I am with you, I will rescue you. 
God gives Jeremiah everything he needs to stand up in faith and declare the hard but very good news. Jeremiah is guaranteed resistance, rejection. But God would rescue him. Jeremiah has run out of excuses before the holy God and he accepts the call of suffering, of preaching, and he waddles out of his complacency. He does so for the sake of Judah, for the sake of sheep without a shepherd, for the encouragement and strengthening of all people, that they may know God's purposes are often carried out in the midst of turmoil. They would be delivered. Benjamin Franklin again says, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Judah was not to wait for things to go back to normal. They were to search for hope in the midst of despair. And if we've learned anything, the world hasn't gotten any better. There's always hardship. There's always despair. Then God commands Jeremiah, now get ready, stand up and tell them everything I command you. The call starts now. Not then, not if, not, not when, not when the wars are over, not when things return to normal. Now, in verse 17, God warns Jeremiah, do not be intimidated by them, or I will terrify you before them. These are hard words. The fear of what others might say, what others might think, the fear of rejection is also no excuse, says God to Jeremiah. In fact, God says, if you feel intimidated by these things, you're not trusting me. If you go in your own strength, you will fail. Perhaps life is never normal. As God's people, we are called to speak to the nations with the Holy Spirit empowering us to be his prophets, priests, and kings. All nations of the earth fulfill God's purposes. Everything is in his hands. And, and that's a lot for us to understand. but we need to be assured that we are part of God's larger redemptive plan that all will come to know Jesus. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of lockdowns, in the midst of hardship. And God promises as he did Jeremiah, I have called you and I will put my words in your mouth. I will equip you. I will sustain you. I will rescue you. These are the words of the Lord to Jeremiah. Many of these words were those which Jesus spoke. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Let's pray. I'm going to begin with a prayer from John Calvin's commentary on Jeremiah 1. Grant, Almighty God, that as you have not only provided for your ancient church by choosing Jeremiah as your servant, but has also designed that the fruit of Jeremiah's labors should continue into our age. O oh, grant that we may not be unthankful to you, but that we may so hand ourselves over to so great a benefit that the fruit of it may appear in us to the glory of your name. May we learn so entirely to devote ourselves to your service and each of us be so attentive to the work of your holy calling that we may strive with united hearts to promote the honor of your name and also the kingdom of your only begotten son until we have finished our warfare and come at length into that celestial rest which has been obtained for us by the blood of your only son we thank you for your word today lord jesus it's not easy for us to hear it's challenging it may even be a little scary 
You are the God who says we will mount up on wings like eagles. And, and so we pray that even hearing these words, there may be a part of us that chooses to fly rather than waddle. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for those times where you have given us wings and where we have said, yeah, we'll fly. Where we've reached out in your name, like, like supporting 541. Where we've reached out in your name with reaching out to others, with providing them their needs. Where we have spent countless hours in prayer that those closest to us might find you, might know your light, might experience your hope and your redemption. We thank you, God, that you have called us as a faithful people and that under the new covenant by grace, we do indeed experience your freedom, that we do indeed experience the empowerment of your Holy Spirit to spur us on toward justice, mercy, and kindness. We thank you that you use us in this way. And so, Lord, we, we ask anew and afresh that if we've become complacent, if we've, we've kind of settled in waiting for a new normal, rise us up again. Refresh our spirits. Give us strength that we may declare your praises. And gracious God, as, as your spirit enables us, we pray with power and with strength for those who need a special touch. For those who are walking in darkness, may, they, may your spirit open up their hearts that when we reach out to them, when we share your word, that they may know you. Would you touch those who have illnesses and struggles that maybe they haven't shared with us, but carry it quietly in their hearts? Lord, sometimes these things are frightening. Sometimes they, they draw us away from you. But Lord, we stand with them in their struggle and we lift them up to you. And we pray that they may feel strengthened by a community, that they may feel strengthened by your word. Above all, we ask for healing. We thank you, O oh God, for medicines that also bring healing. We think of Kim undergoing treatments where, where they just feel so awful, but Lord, you're using it for her good. Would you sustain her with every treatment? Would you build up her immunity so that she may sustain this journey? Father, for others who are needing your help, whether it be in their relationships, whether it be within their own spirits, whether it, it be that they themselves feel distant from you. Jesus, come. Uphold your people. Give them strength. Lord, as we think about the Canadian nation looking for new leadership, we pray for them. We lay down our frustrations. We lay down our complaints. And Jesus, we pray for them that they may have wisdom to lead well, not, not for popularity, but that they may advocate for justice and righteousness, that they may hear your voice regardless of who comes into power. And Father, we pray for this nation. We pray that Canada may turn its heart toward you. that it may have peace. Father, in all things, help us to be your servants. To the glory of Jesus Christ, we pray.
Amen. Let's respond with singing, Take Time to Be Holy. Please stand and hear the promises and assurance of Jeremiah's word, the Lord's word for you. The Lord your God is with you and he will make you a new covenant people. He will put his law in your minds and write them on your hearts. He will be your God and you will be his people. No longer will you teach your neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Go then as new covenant people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>